Hello everyone and welcome to part 2 of this week's Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2 update on the Lawrence Plays channel. And well, as you can probably tell, one of the things that happened in the last stream was that Mark started making Spidertrons. Yes, yes, there, there's one going, uh, bimbling its way across the landscape down there. And this was produced in the normal, well, let's just make some stuff up down on the ground area. So over here you can see we're making the Spidertrons, we're also making rocket launchers and uh, power systems for the, for the Spidertrons, as well as all a load of other th bits and pieces that are required for, uh, putting, for putting into your armour and, and making you a bit more powerful, a bit more generally effective. And we've got two areas that are doing this sort of thing. There's one down here on the ground for things that can be made down here, and there's one up in space for things that have to be made up there. And to be honest, the, um, the line isn't quite as, as, as well drawn as it should be. I think there's probably some things being built in the wrong place, but uh, yeah, they're being made in two places just to keep us guessing. And so Mark sent the Spidertron out into the wild unknowns to go off and do some combat -y type stuff. It didn't last very long. I don't think I'm going to be able to... No, I think its corpse is going to have despawned by now. But it got to, it got destroyed somewhere around here, I think, because he charged it right into the middle of too many nests. So maybe next time we uh, maybe next time we have a uh, Spidertron going scampering around like this, we should perhaps have give it some friends to take with it so they can provide a bit of fire support for each other. Because it uh, it couldn't quite cope with the amount of with the number of biters that were going on out there. Or maybe we just need to give it bigger guns or. I suppose, more intelligent uh, driving. And to be fair, he did put a certain amount of kit in the Spidertron. Uh, this is not the kit that was in that Spidertron. This is just me having chucked a load of stuff in because, well, the um, the, the spider was the other spider was killed. But it had power supplies. It had uh, it had rocket launchers with ammunition and, and and so on and so on and exoskeletons to make it move faster. But even so, it wasn't able to uh, it wasn't able to cope. It, and as I say, it didn't last for as long as we would have liked it to. However, having all of this stuff available down here, and also the stuff that's available up in the in orbit, has allowed us to start sort of filling our armour with various useful things. So I now have, I've upgraded a little bit. I do still have an RTG in there for some reason, but I've also got two of the portable fusion reactors. And those use the DT fuel cells that are coming out of here, so we turn thorium, which is being made, I don't know where it's being made actually, because tritium, not thorium, sorry, is made when you recycle uranium fuel cells, but apparently there's a couple of other ways of making it, so, um, such as uh, rare metals, lithium and uranium can also make tritium. So that'll be where we're getting the supply of it from in order to make these fuel cells over here because we haven't used nuclear power enough to produce a decent amount of the tritium in order to keep in order to supply all of the armor that we're creating that has loads of these uh, portable fusion reactors in. And as you can see, this is my sort of, this is my one that's for sort of exploration and and stuff like that. So I've got a huge number of these jetpacks in of jetpack Mark IVs in here, and that means I can move around really really quickly, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I've got a couple of power supplies to keep everything running. I don't really need the RTG anymore. I should probably get rid of that. Even though, it's sort of, even though it doesn't require fuel. And then I've got a load of roboports in here, and there's a couple of reasons for having lots of roboports in your inventory. And now that I'm outside the factory, I can demonstrate those. So if I switch over, to, if I um, show, demonstrate my blueprint planner, you can see how big an area I can currently, I can cover at the moment. If I drop down to a single roboport, it's a much smaller area. So you get two big advantages from having lots and lots of roboports in your, in your suit. One is that your logistics area coverage, so the area that your robots will work over will expand massively. So I could deconstruct those rocks up there, for example. And and off will go my bots to go and get them. The other big advantage is that you can also you can then have many many more bots working to do your bidding. So instead of having, I think it's something like 50 per roboport. Yes, yeah, so, no, 30 per roboport. So the more roboports you have, the more you can, the more bots you can run, and the more you can charge at a time. However, all of this is quite, it is it does put quite a, a drain on your batteries. You can see down here in the corner, my uh, my battery charge level has dropped down to 40 percent, despite the fact that all I did was grab up some rocks from over there. Oh, and I did take the uh, Reports out of my inventory and put them back in again, so that will have caused them to discharge and recharge again. So you can see, but you can see that my point: you're using up quite a lot of power just from using the uh, just from using that many rover ports, and that's why I've got the two big reactors in there. This one just couldn't keep up. I've then got a couple of large batteries in here that gives me lots and lots of power. Uh, so in order to keep the rover ports running for at least a little while after I after I use the bots for something, and I've got several of the armors. So when I do when I do encounter some biters, and there's some over here. Well, there's some there's some worms over here that even when they do attack me, well, it does a certain amount of damage to my to my armor. What was that that hit me? That was a big worm. We've got another big and a behemoth over there that would do more damage. So even with but with those. As you can see, it only did a small amount of damage and it's already already been fixed because I've got all of these uh, Adaptive Armor Mark V's available down here. Now, as we've discussed before, the Adaptive Armors aren't as good as the Shield Projectors. They don't give you as much armor, they don't char recharge as quickly, but they do work with the jetpack. I don't actually have any shields with me to demonstrate, but I believe you can't put the shields into the into the thruster suit. And if you use the jetpack when you when you have a, a shield, the shield will very very quickly lose lose strength and power and have to be recharged. So you burn through all of your battery power very very quickly if you try flying around. 
I do also have a Power Armor Mark IV. Uh, I haven't filled up the inventory on this one yet. I do have some stuff I could put in it. This probably won't be what goes in there. But eventually this will have this will be used for combat. So it'll have a, a, probably a couple of exoskeletons, loads of the shields, and then lots of batteries, power generation, and and most importantly, lots and lots of lasers. So these would be good for going into um, going into pyramids, for example, or doing any sort of combat that I can't do at extreme range by put by turret creep or missiles or plague rockets or anything like that. Finally in here, I've also put in a life support Mark III. Now this seems a little bit pointless at first thought, because the, the thruster suit comes with a built-in life support Mark I, so you don't, you don't actually need the Mark III to, in order to fly around in space and not die. But upgrading your life support equipment means that the, uh, the, the life support canisters will each last a, quite a bit longer. And my first thought was, who cares? They're really cheap, the bots will bring them out to me as I need them, and they get cleaned out, and all it takes is some water and some coal to re re uh, restart them. However, after I've been going out to uh, Stardust quite a lot, it's occurred to me that if I can just if I can make one stack of life support canisters last a bit longer then I don't need to spend as much inventory space on keeping my on keeping myself alive and there have been one or two times when I've started to run a bit low on them and I've had to come home because I don't have any facilities out in Stardust that can replenish the life support cans and so having it last what it says here, it says plus 400%, so five times as long, is going to be much, much better. It's going to, be, it's going to keep me, um, it's going to keep me alive for much longer without having to come back and resupply. And as you can see down here, I've got almost 14 hours worth of uh, life support available from the extra 100 pack packs I got over here and whatever's running through that one at the moment. So it makes a big difference. Mike has done similar things with his his uh, armor and thruster suit. So he's uh, upgraded his thruster suit to have high end jetpacks, batteries, and uh, and the fusion reactors, much like I have, done much very much the same sort of thing. And he's filled up his, his power armor. Mark IV with um, weapons and power generation, a little bit of armor, and he's gone for jetpacks in his because I guess he's flying around doing combat a bit more. I'm not sure. There are there are two different ways to look at it, but you're not allowed to put uh, laser weapons into uh, into thruster suits, and you can't use ha power armor in space. So you kind of need both of them for, for for different use cases. He's also grabbed himself the anti-materiel rifle, which is the one I think the one we've been calling a railgun because it's really really effective against uh, against the um, the biter nests because you can shoot through lots and lots of them with a single shot. Um, um, and, and the Tesla gun, which is the lightning one that scatters lightning all over the place. And the Glacier gun, which puts up a little wall. Um, and if I remember, I'll do some extra footage with Creative Mod running where I'll demonstrate each of these weapons. The next thing I want to talk about is that we had some some problems with our spaceship throughput. And I have to admit, I'm still not quite sure what caused all of this to go a bit wrong. So. We had um, the Agnea spaceship was parked here, and it, it had unloaded um, all of, and it had unloaded as much of the uh, refined vulcanite as it could. But then the system had jammed up because, well, there wasn't room to unload it all. So for some reason, it had brought too much over, and that had meant that the ship was stuck here. It stopped flying back and forth, and so we'd more or less run out of vulcanite as well. Additionally, it had unloaded unloaded some sulfur that had gone out here and gone over in, into the into the, into the dump system over here. And the sulfur should never be taken out because the sulfur is meant to be fed in this side and then taken off to Agnair and used over there. So. I'm not sure what caused that to happen. We're wondering if perhaps there was a power cut on Agnea, but we went back and looked through the evidence. Couldn't find any. It doesn't look like that's what happened, but to be honest, we, yeah, we are very, very puzzled. And that meant that the, uh, yeah, the whole Vulcanite system had ground to a halt. We had a similar problem with Kothar. I say a similar problem. It wasn't It wasn't due to the Kothar ship bringing too much stuff back that it couldn't unload, but it was running out of Vulcanite blocks over on, on Kothar. Now, it's possible that that could be linked to there not being enough being brought over from Agnea, but I don't think it was, because I'm pretty sure this belt down here was still full, uh, and there's a there's a, a, a supply kept in this, in this chest down here, and the ship shouldn't have left here if it couldn't find any vulcanite. So I don't think that was a problem. It's a bit of a mystery, to be honest. However, the ship had had some problems. There wasn't enough vulcanite over on Kothar, so that one had broken as well. Additionally, the Talos ship, the one that's bringing back the beryllium, had, had failed as well. And that's a very weird one. It looked like it had run out of sulfur over there, which I'll go and put point, point at and laugh in a, in a moment. But that, again, is a bit strange, because the ship should pick up enough. Now, I'm wondering if some of the sulfur managed to get turned into acid that somehow got used for the Naquium production, rather than for beryllium production and that took some of it off the top but it meant that we we were gradually we had an enormous stockpile of beryllium at one point and then we seem to have gradually worked our way through it until now we, well we, we'd more or less run out i think a ship has come over and we've stocked uh, loaded it back up again but yeah there were lots of things lots of the ships had stopped working properly and we're having all kinds of issues so starting from the top over on agnea we drop stop we'd stop bringing over sulfur now this in theory isn't a problem so we we do the use we do need the sulfur it's used as part of the um the vulcanite processing so it comes up here goes under these belts and is used to 
produce the produce the vulcanite. But the because we can produce sulfur on on Agnair by by bringing in oil and turning it into sulfur, and as you do, uh, it's only a sort of a it's Agnair is a sulfur sink. So we have Taras, the imasite planet, which produces quite a lot of sulfur as a byproduct of producing the imasite, and so that all gets shipped back to Norbit where we have a cunning system that unloads just over here, dumps all the sulfur down down this way onto the belts here, and then we have a system of checks and balances that ensures if there's too much sulfur, it gets loaded into the Agnea ship and disposed of, but if there's not enough, or if there's only a small amount of it, then we don't. Because the last thing we want is to be making loads and loads of sulfur on Norvis, bringing it up here, dropping it off, taking it over, and taking it away over to Agnea, because it's much easier just to make it on site. However, if there's too much sulfur, because Taras has been bringing loads in because we've been making loads of Imasite, then it's very very useful to have a have a sink for it on Agnea. And so the idea is we bring it in, if we have any it gets used as a priority, there is a priority splitter somewhere, I can't, I can't find it at the moment. Uh, um, yes there we go, here is the priority splitter, so we use that as a priority, but if there's a shortage of it then we can still pull it in from over here. However, we're also bringing ice over because this is a very, very dry planet. So we're bringing ice over from um, from Norvis as well, and that is vital. So that's fed up here. It goes into the uh, the, the processing of it for the system over here, where we make it into water, which is then used to cool down the uh, vulcanite to make it solidify. I don't know. And whatever it whatever it's used for, it's, it's turned into steam here. We generate. We oh no, we don't even generate power from it. We uh, squish it back into water and then pass it around and round and round. Uh, however, we need to make sure that we keep enough of it going. That we don't run out, that we don't run out of water, because it's need that there, needed there, and it's also needed over here in order to crack the oil down into into sulfur, and so because we'd run out of ice, we'd therefore also run out of sulfur, which meant that all of the uh, all the vulcanite processing just ground to a halt and and then and caused problems. Now, as you notice, it is all it is also uh, still ground to a halt. It is not running at the moment, but that is deliberate because we now have enough vulcanite, or at least we think we do. So we have a number being transmitted over from Norvis that tells us how much of each of the two types of vulcanite, the enriched and the, the blocks, that we have over there. And if it's less than zero, then we'll feed through from here. And this is the vulcanite that's produced from the core processing. So we bring in bring in core chunks here, chunk it, cr crush it down into, into vulcanite, and that's processed in these two, system, these two areas around here to make the vulcanite that we need. And then that's passed off down down the belts over here. And if it's, so, if it's less than zero, we'll pass that in because we because we need some. The rest of them are looking for it to be less than minus fifty because that means we've got a real shortage of it. We've ripped through it very very quickly, and we need a lot more. And if that happens, then the other ones, the ones that are being fed from the mines, kick in as well. And so we'll get a lot more through. This is very very similar to the system that was running over on uh, Talos to make the beryllium, which I talked about uh, probably a few months ago, whenever it was that I was getting that set up and and and, uh, and, and arranged properly. And the idea is that the stuff that comes from mines will be used if you have an absolute shortage, but if you've got a reasonable amount of it, the stuff from the uh, f from the uh, core processing will be used in preference because it's cheaper. It comes from a res it comes from resource supply that won't run out. Eventually, the mines we have set up. There's one over here that has okay, it has eight million in it. There's another one over here with thirteen million in. There's quite a lot over there, so it's going to be a long take us a long time to actually run out. But in theory, we could, oh, and we've got some more mines over here, so it would take even longer because there's another 40, 50 million over there. So it's going to take a long time to get through those. But in the interest of just being sensible, we might as well use the stuff that comes from the core chunks first. And we get a load of other resources from that, which is potentially useful. We can pulverise that down and get all of the, all of the other stuff we need and, and, and feed that through. Over on Talos, the system had ground down, ground to a halt for much more mundane reasons. We hadn't been able to fill up the spaceship up in orbit, which meant it hadn't gone. And we hadn't been able to fill up the spaceship because we'd run out of sulphur down here. So this this uh, this belt of sulphur that goes all the way over here to be made into acid, to then be fed round various long pipes and go into the beryllium processing over here, that had dried up and we and, and it had stopped working. And so we weren't able to process the beryllium. Now, I'm not 100% sure why that had happened. Because in theory, the sulfuric acid that's being used to make beryllium comes from a different that comes from this sulphur source, and the sulfuric acid that's being used to make the naquium comes from over here where make where we're making the acid here. And so this is piped up from here and goes over to the uh, beryllium processing machines up here. And you can see this pipe comes in here to do this machine, which feeds off the beryllium sulfate to go over to the naquium processing. But it doesn't. You can see the, uh, the, the pipes, the two pipes are not linked over here. So we're not using the sulfur that comes in for beryllium production um, or in these machines. We're only using it in these machines and, and all of the other ones around. And those are ones that are just making beryllium, beryllium to go straight into beryllium production. So I don't really understand why that had got confused and ground to a halt and just 
failed, but for some reason it did. So I whacked in an underground pipe across here to steal a little bit of sulfur from over here to get the machines running again a little bit in order to top off the spaceship because it was nearly full and get it to fly back. So there should be enough sulfur in this in this system. So we we actually we, we are using up the, the the last of it to an extent, but there should have been enough brought over in order to make the, in order to make an entire spaceship full of uh, beryllium and the byproducts that come out from it. And if we look at the spaceship, we can see that it's less than half full. However, oh, there is also quite a lot of sulfur still up here that needs to be brought back down. So as the train goes round and round, each time it comes up here, it'll bring down some more sulfur, and we'll be able to get the uh, the system topped up and bring down some more cryonite as well. And make sure that's kept topped up. And so, the fact that this warehouse is emptied is not the end of the world, because once the train fills up, which it, well, it's less than half full, but this is, should be easily enough sulphur to fill it up, then it can go around, it can pick up some more sulphur, and hopefully the problem will all be sorted. I talked previously about how we have the system over here that's watching for how much um, beryllium there is over in, uh, in Norbit, and then feeding feeding the system from the uh, from the mines as well, as, as you can see is happening up here, if, the, if, if there's a shortage. And at the moment, we still have... We have 38,000 uh, beryllium over there apparently, and we're running this whenever we have less than 60,000. There should probably be some negative numbers in there, to be honest, just to make sure. But uh, I haven't, I haven't fitted those in because we're, because of the system we're using here. It's, it's not, it's not really practical. Uh, this does mean if there's a power failure in Norvis, the system will break down over here, and we'll just always run these these production systems. But that's not really the end of the world because, well, if if the power breaks down in Norvis, we have bigger problems. And also, if we make a bit of extra. Uh, beryllium from the mines it doesn't really matter not the end of the world i do think in hindsight i should have made this train longer but um this was a setup that i put in quite early on in the game i touched on the Kotharian vulcanite shortage now tristan says he he helped it a little bit by giving the spaceship a manual nudge so telling it to clear off go back over to norvis pick up some more and come back again and unload whatever was whatever it had and so that has worked for a little while at least, although I do notice now that we've got down to little enough here that the train is, this train has not filled up, and therefore it's not bringing any down here, and we have run out once again. Uh, the belts are, as you can see, empty, so we're not making any of this. We've got enough buffer of the cation exchange beads that it seems that the system is still kind of working. Um, it hasn't quite run out yet, so we are still producing the, um, the iridium over here. Uh, where's the, my question is, where's the spaceship? And the answer is, there it is. It's on its way back from Norvis. This spaceship probably has lots and lots of vulcanite in it. Yes, it does. So we've got another 10,000 vulcanite in here. So hopefully when that arrives, it will, that will be enough vulcanite to produce enough iridium to fill the spaceship back up again. And looking in Kothar orbit, we currently have... Mm, less than 20% of a spaceship ready over here. So it's going to take a little while for this to be... It's going to take quite a lot of Iridium uh, production in order to get this back up to full and, and send the spaceship off again, but hopefully it's going to bring out enough. That's something we're going to need to keep an eye on, though, because it had a problem, and we're not entirely sure why it had the problem. The spaceship was given a, nu a manual nudge, but we don't want to have to baby the system. Assist uh, going in there and nudging systems to make them run a little bit faster, if you think they'll catch up, is okay. But going in and sort of saying, well, this system requires manual intervention, that's not okay. We want the ships to be automatic just to be automatic and and flying backwards and forwards and make sure they bring out enough so maybe we're going to need to start requesting more than 10,000 vulcanite I don't know it's, it's it's a little bit odd because I'm sure this system was working for quite a long time so maybe there's been some funny shenaniganery business with the uh, with the recipe changes that came through in the update and that's meaning that we don't that we somehow need slightly more vulcanite in the system or maybe it's because we've been upgrading the productivity modules but that shouldn't affect that I don't know there's clearly, the, the numbers may be a little bit out of whack, we'll keep an eye on it and change the numbers if we need to, 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 to re-whack them and get them get them whacking better. Njord also was having similar problems, we weren't getting enough Holmium out, so again, this one, this one did turn out to be an update issue, so Tristan's had a look at it, and it turns out it was due to the recipe changes for the hydrogen chloride, now requiring, was it, they, now requiring more hydrogen, so he's put in more machines to make the hydrogen, uh, that's, oh, oh goodness knows. All of these seem to be neatly balanced together, maybe there's more, maybe He's put in more machines there. There doesn't seem to be a feed of hydrogen going in anywhere. Uh, and the same along here. So, yeah, apparently more hydrogen was required. So he's come in and fixed that. Uh, but that was, as I say, another another problem in, in, in inflicted on us by the update, where lots and lots of recipes got changed to make, uh, to, 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 I don't know, to balance things out a bit better for the uh, for how space exploration was intended to be. Who knows? But whatever, whatever the reasoning was, it, it, uh, it, it broke our whole in production. 
And I think a lot of this was noticed by looking at the graph over here. So um, if we look at the exotic metals, they are in this area around here. So you, you can see at a glance, well, the, uh, the vulcanite has recovered. I don't believe there's ever a problem with the cryonite. The beryllium is in the process of recovering. It's, it's not too bad. The holmium is dreadful, so we need to get some more of that brought in. And, well, there are a couple of shortages over here with some of the biologicals. Maybe we, maybe we need to look at those and get that improved. We also have a crisis with the, uh, the emosite crystals, but I think Mark was looking into that. And so, moving on, I talked a lot last week about how I'm making lots and lots of particle stream and how we're now doing it with the new recipe. So I won't talk about this in too much detail, but I will say that I expanded this out. So I think I stuck one extra machine on the end and then doubled it by putting in this second row along here. And in order to make sure that there was plenty of throughput for that, I put in this second belt of stone coming out of here. So now we've gone from uh, half a belt of each uh, to one and a half belts of the of the stone and half a belt of the bacon data and that should be plenty because if we, if we look at the recipe you can see that it uses 10 times as much stone as it does matter liberation data and so i think having three times as much stone is going to be fine we're not well we're not going to run out of matter liberation data anyway that's for sure and so i uh, with with the pumps over here now i've now got to, well this this tank is nearly full we're pumping out of that whenever it's above 15000 and we can see that the tank over here is nearly full we're pumping in there when that's less than 45 i don't know why there's i don't know why there's a limiter on that one we could probably just say Oh, no, I, no, I do know why there's a limiter on that one. It's because some of the other recipes do output a little bit of particle stream. So we don't want to have this go all the way up to 100% full. Keeping this at 80% full is, is very, very handy. But that meant that now up here, I was able to switch the uh, switch the pumping and everything around up here. So we're now trying to top these tanks off. We've got a train full over here. And now this is a particle stream pickup instead of a particle stream drop off. To go with that... I've also removed the new particle stream area that I put in over here because it was now pointless. We didn't want to we didn't want to run off run this area. We don't want to make particle stream the expensive way. As you can tell by looking at these belts, I turned them round to feed the uh, the lithium was it lith yes lithium back up here so it can now be used by for making uh, plasma stream in order to make ion stream, which we are still making over here. And at some point, I need to tidy this up a little bit more and get rid of all of these material testing packs, send them back over to, I don't know, somewhere else that needs them. I'm not really sure, but I don't really care. And I can also pull up all of these pipes and belts and things over here. So there's a little bit of tidying up left to be done. I think I was waiting for things to be generally drained. Maybe I'll put a pump in over here somewhere so it slurps all the rest of this out, and then we'll have empty empty pipes and we won't be wasting the however much particle stream is in there. But that, of course, leads on to the antimatter production that I was talking about yesterday, and so, therefore, I won't talk about it again. But as you can see down here, we have a basically full pipe. We have loads of it. We have a station that's bringing it in here, and that's bringing it over from the area I just pointed at. So when when that, when this when these tanks start to run a bit low, we can bring another train over, and we're bringing it over by train now, and we should have plenty of it. At some point, we may even consider pulling up the uh, particle stream production over here, because this again is unnecessary and inefficient. We can just bring it, we can have, turn this into a drop-off station and have trains bringing particle stream in here. Or actually not even that, because there's no particle stream being picked up from here. This is just this is just a pickup station for it, and I don't know where it's being taken to. I don't think there's anywhere that uses it. I think this is just somewhere we we need to, we want to drain this all out, drain this all out, and stop making it here because there's no. I don't think there's any point. The only places we're using particle stream are in energy and matter data down here, and in deep space data over here. So yeah, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. It's completely unnecessary now. Over in Stardust, I have completely changed around the way the trains work. So previously, we had all the stations with the same name. They were all called Naquatite Pickup, and then we had two stations called Naquatite Drop. And every train would go from Naquatite Pickup to Naquatite Drop. So whenever it left here, it would go off to whichever was the nearest station that had enough Naquatite to pick up, and then bring it back over here. Now that was that kind of worked, but it did mean that lots of the more distant stations just straight up weren't being used. And so I decided a better way to do it would be to rename the stations. So each one is now each one is now numbered. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, all the way down to here. And then instead of having the train limits being set by feeding a signal into the station or by looking at how much naquatite there was, now we've just got the train limit locked to one. So it will always call its own personal train over. And as part of that, I've told each, I've reset changed each of the trains around to then go from naquatite drops. So they'll go to either naquatite drop, but then they'll go over to whichever naquatite pickup station want uh, they, they are they are fixed to. So we now have one train per station, which is why we have trains parked in one, two, three, 
three of four of the uh, four of the stations around here. Just and I was going to say just waiting to be loaded up. That's probably not the case. They're probably absolutely full. Yes, they are. But they can't leave because we still have uh, train limits of three or four set on the two drop stations over here. And because we have more Naquium than we know what to do with at the moment, because we've not been doing deep space sciences, uh, the system has kind of ground to a halt. It's just it's just full. So we've got all the, as you can see here, all of these uh, warehouses are full. We have stopped making sulfuric acid as is traditional, and we've run out of it over here, which probably means this train is not going to be able to leave until another spaceship arrives. But that doesn't actually matter because everything is full. So we need to start doing deep space science again in order to start churning through the Naquium so I can really tell whether this system is going to be fast enough when we have the factory all in running at full bore. But I have not been able to check that because we just haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll point out why when we get down when I get onto the research section in, uh, later on. Speaking of the acid production, the acid production has been a big problem here um, because when a spaceship turns up, it brings out a load of sulfur that can then be made into acid that then gets put into the trains to be taken off to do the mining. Great. The problem is that the spaceships only bring in about well they 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 bring in more than enough to fill themselves up with um, with, with nequitite. However. We have a lot of buffers around here to fill up. So all of the mines have got significant buffers in them. So if I come over here and look at this one, we have a tank here that's trying to fill up to, well, it was trying to fill up to um, 100,000. Now I've twitched I was going to say I've tweaked the number so it only fills up to about 50,000. That's not the case. I haven't done this one. But some of them I've changed to only fill up to 50,000. But still, when I put in new mines, that means each one is required requesting at least 50,000 acid. So these, these tanks then drain fairly quickly into, into doing that, in, into filling those up. Then I put in trains. Each one of those needs to then fill up to 30,000 acid. Um, so that's another load on it. So for each new mine we put in, that's 80,000 at least. And at that point, you're looking at almost the amount of acid needed to produce a spaceship's worth of nequitite, and therefore about the amount that's being brought in by the spaceships as well. So I upped, it, upped the number a little bit on the on the uh, requestimatron over here, and then dropped it back down again after, after a couple of spaceships had left with the extra. I don't know whether dropping it back down was the right thing to do. But the thing is, the system is basically working. When the next spaceship arrives, it will fill up with the Naquatite that's in these three warehouses here. There's no problem there. We've got plenty of it. And then it will it will unload its sulfur and it will immediately leave. When the next spaceship arrives, that sulfur will have been turned into acid and the trains will have bimbled around a bit more and therefore will have enough for the next spaceship to be filled up, probably. And so on. So it should be absolutely fine. And as each spaceship arrives with a bit more sulfur than it than is required just to fill that spaceship up, we should eventually manage to fill all of these buffers up and then everything should be okay. It has led to me doing a little bit of babying of the train. So sometimes when I see a train that's run out, that's un unloaded all of its naquatite, but, but hasn't managed to fill up completely with sulfuric acid, then I'll tell it to clear off. So like for this one, for example, it's still got 3,000, okay, it's still got 3,000 naquatite in it, but I could tell it to clear off even though it's not finished update, uh, finished unloading. And then we'll have this one we'll pull in and then we'll have a full load of naquatite ready to unload. And so it's, it's a bit pointless. Well, that one was completely pointless. But in general, it's it's not absolutely necessary. The system would eventually manage to keep up, but it speeds things up a little bit if I give the trains a nudge every so often. What did also cause problems was that my iron... So for sulfuric acid, you need iron and, and sulfur. You mix those two together and, uh, and, and that makes sulfuric acid. My iron mine down here was getting to the point... Well, it was, it was always quite a small iron mine and, it, and I used that patch because it was really, really close to the factory. Um, but it was a small patch, so it wasn't producing it very quickly. And so it, that mine wasn't able to keep up with the demands on the iron over here. And so I put in a, a slightly bigger one over here, which is producing the iron ore at a much, much faster rate. There's loads of loaders here to fill the train up really quickly. This is more than capable of keeping up with what's required over there. The other part of the, uh, the question is whether this uh, iron smelter is going to be able to keep up. Uh, someone else on stream did the maths and told me that I needed two of them. However, I then pointed out that we have the uh, the wide area beacon over here that is affecting both sulfuric acid production and uh, iron production down here. And, and uh, that's about all. I, it probably doesn't affect any of the machines around here. Um, and so that should now be absolutely fine, especially we've got a little bit of a buffer here. We've got 86 inside it. We've got all of this on the belt here. I think it's probably going to be absolutely fine. Okay, I have now reached a slightly awkward point in the video where I don't have an enormous amount left to talk about, although there is there is still some, so I think it's probably going to be okay, but I've reached a decent amount of time for the video, so I think I'm going to cut it here, and we are going to make this a three video week, so um, I hope, you, hope you'll enjoy the, the extra video, and that, that'll be why yesterday's one came out on Friday, and so, yeah, great. <laughs> so there will be another one of these videos tomorrow, so please make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on that, and we'll be back on Monday with the next stream where we shall fix all the problems
problems I've been talking about today, and probably go off and make some new problems as well. Uh, I shall also be back on Wednesday for some more Satisfactory, when I shall be carrying on with building out my t little town areas. Uh, I've gone over to start thinking about some um, aluminium, I've made myself a rifle, and I've and a lewd, well I'm in the process of making a ludicrously tall elevator as well to bring stuff down an enormous cliff face. Um, and, and then a bit of grumbling about trains, and maybe, maybe looking into better ways to use blueprints. So make sure you come along on Wednesday so you don't miss out on that one. There should be other videos coming out at some point, but that just requires me to have actually have time to make them, so they're a little bit in, a little bit short supply at the moment, sorry about that. But there'll be more stuff on the channel as ever, so as I say, make sure you're subscribed. I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.